Amen. Well, this morning we kick off a new series here at Southside. If you're a guest, we normally just walk through books of the Bible. This fall we're taking a rare break from a book of the Bible and tackling several objections to the Christian faith. This morning we're looking at, isn't the church full of hypocrites? Next week we'll look at the objection, isn't Christianity anti-science? Then we'll look at the problem of evil and uh, the problem of hell and race and, and heaven and exclusivity and sexuality. And this morning we're going to ask the question... Isn't the Christian church filled with a bunch of hypocrites? Yes, I'll see you next week. <laughs> There's a longer answer, though. It is a strong objection. Aren't Christians really just people who say one thing but live another way? I mean, maybe you've Googled pastor arrested. Even worse, youth pastor arrested. Aren't Christians no different than any other unbeliever I know? I mean, look at all the different denominations. Look at all the division. Look at the church's historical record, their support of slavery and segregation. Look at the Inquisition. Look at the Crusades. Or maybe you're here and you personally have been hurt. Many, I'd say most, if you've been in the church any amount of time, have been hurt by other Christians. It's a great question, and it's a serious one. About 10 years ago, the Barna Group did some extensive research asking non-Christians why they rejected the Christian faith. And the top three were, number one, they're anti-homosexual. Number two, they're too judgmental. We'll actually be looking at both those this series, but this morning we'll tackle a third. They're hypocritical. Third most popular reason why people reject Jesus is because they think the church is hypocritical. So how can we as the church answer this objection? I think there are four valid and helpful ways we can think about it. Number one, if this is you, you're in good company in terms of you accusing the church of hypocrisy. Number two, we have to consider what the Bible teaches on what a Christian actually is, what the Bible teaches about conversion. Number three, we need to acknowledge that we are all works in progress. And the fourth thing is to just realize that the accusation of hypocrisy actually confirms the message of Christianity. So number one, people who criticize hypocrites are actually in good company. Jesus joins you. We're going to be looking at the Gospel of Matthew. So if you want to go ahead and grab your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 23. If you're using one of our pew Bibles, there's an Old Testament and then the New Testament begins over in, in page 1. So it's page 19 of the New Testament. Matthew's the first book of the New Testament. We're going to see that Jesus reserved some of his harshest criticisms for those who talked the talk but didn't walk the walk. Jesus criticizes hypocrites. And I want to look at some of this chapter and just see five, five ways, five reasons that Jesus criticizes hypocrites. The first is they don't talk, again, they don't walk the walk. They talk the talk, they don't walk the walk. They don't practice what they preach, Jesus says. Look at Matthew chapter 23, verse 1. I still hear pages turning. I'll wait a moment. Matthew 23, verse 1. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the scribes, teachers of the law, and the Pharisees, religious leaders, they sit on Moses' seat. So do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do. For they preach... But do not practice. These folks, their lives weren't just an occasional inconsistency. They were full of inconsistency. And so Jesus says, do what they teach from the law, but don't do what they do. And so you've got a problem with people who say one thing, but their lives are actually in opposition to what the Bible says. Jesus joins you in your sermon. He hops on the soapbox with you. He amends your critique. And you know, you can't do this, right? As parents, you can't tell your kids, hey, do what I say, not what I do. It doesn't work. And so Jesus agrees. They don't practice what they preach. Second reason he critiques them is they really don't care about people. They just want to burden others while not lifting a finger themselves. Look at Matthew 23, verse 4. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. They don't even lift a finger. 
This idea is teaching. This, this, this heavy load, this burdensome load is their teaching. That's the way Jewish people would often talk about their teaching. And so they don't really practice it themselves, but they add rules and they add layers to the law and they make it burdensome for the people of God. Sometimes it was called a yoke. A yoke was something you would put on your shoulders to try to distribute the weight evenly. And what does Jesus say about his yoke? He says his yoke is easy in Matthew chapter 11. His burden is light. His teaching is meant to lead to human flourishing. But these hypocrites, they just add burden after burden, heavy burdens, hard to bear, but they don't practice it. Number three, they just practice their religion to look good. Look at verse 5 of Matthew 23. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long and they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. Jesus says they make their phylacteries wide. And you're like, what? Come again. Phylacteries were those things that usually they took Deuteronomy 6 very literally and they put a copy of the law or at least sections of the copy of the law on their head and they would wrap leather around their arms and so they would make it very wide, very noticeable. Who has the widest phylacteries or their prayer tassels on their garment making them long again just to show off, to be seen by others. They wanted to appear serious about God externally. They really just cared about the approval of people. And we know people like this, right? Maybe we've been people like this. I've been there. The dude rocking the three WWJD bracelets. You know, the Christian hat. I didn't wear Abercrombie and Fish. I wore a breadcrumb and fish. <laughs> didn't go to Gold's Gym. I took the L out. Went to God's Gym. I was just in Mardell's with our boys this, this weekend. And one of our sons is a big Star Wars fan. So he noticed the Star Wars logo. But it didn't say, may the force be with you. It said, may the Lord be with you. <laughs> Maybe it's the big old foot-breaking Bible. Maybe it's the clerical collar. It's the people that love titles. It's the person who can't have a quiet time without posting it on social media. <laughs> I've got a product I want to share with you. Let's show a video real quick to help you with your quiet times. <laughs> What's the point? What's the point of doing devotions if no one knows about it? This is the problem Jesus has, though. These folks are in it just to be seen, which is what they, their garb communicates. Jesus has a problem with it. He says, you hypocrites. What's the fourth reason? Fourth reason is, they, again, they care about the externals, but they don't care about what really matters. Look at Matthew 23, verse 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mints and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. They got extremely precise with all the externals. So the law commanded them to tithe plants, their crops, but they got down to even the spices mint and dill and cumin, the spices from the plants. I mean, these folks were serious. This would be like you going down to Central Market, buying a loaf of bread, bringing two loaves and putting in the offering box, coming across a quarter, making change, getting three pennies, putting the offering. They're serious, but they're neglecting the matters of the heart, the weightier matters of the law. They strain out. They would have to strain. Often in first century culture, you would have your wine or your grape juice, and you would need to strain it, right? There would be chunks or gnats or bugs or whatever, so you would strain it out. Well, they would strain it out, and they would catch the gnat and then swallow a camel, paying attention to some little things, missing something much larger. That's the point. There's also an Aramaic wordplay here with camel and gnat. Gnat is qualma. Camel is gamla. You would hear it in the original. The point is they focus on legal minutiae but miss and disregard the main tenets of the law. And then finally, the fifth reason Jesus critiques and joins your critique of hypocrites is they look holy on the outside, but on the inside, they're dead. Where it counts, there is no life. Look at verse 25. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, 
For you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside also may be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Shiny on the outside, but filthy, decaying on the inside. Full of greed and self-indulgence. Like fancy tombs, they look great on the outside, Inside, they're rotting corpses. Outside, a fresh slab of paint. Inside, bones, hypocrisy, wickedness. I can't help here but think of the Roman Catholic Church and the scandal we see here. Outside, looking extremely religious. And I don't know the, I'm not Catholic. I don't know the polity of the Catholic Church. I'm so Protestant. Literally, I had the five solas on the Reformation on my groom's cake. We are capital P Protestant. We are still protesting. Uh, we take that seriously because of the doctrine. So I don't know the polity, but allegations are now that the Pope knew about the molestation. Many leaders knew, and even the Pope knew, and is just moving people around, sexual predators. That is not Christianity. That is not biblical Christianity. This indictment of the Lord of Lords is what they would fall under and what they will fall under. He has nothing to do with such hypocrisy. Religious looking on the outside, full of self-indulgence on the inside. So you're in good company. Jesus has no patience for those who try to look religious. In fact, he's rather harsh towards them. Just a few verses later, he says this, You snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? So you have a problem with religious hypocrites, you're in good company. So does Jesus. In fact, there's in one sense, Jesus came to rid the world of merely external hypocritical religion. His most famous sermon is the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5 to 7, and it's structured around two ways to live. And often we probably think, well, yeah, it's the Christian way and the pagan way. Other passages do talk about those two ways, most notably Psalm 1. That's not what the Sermon on the Mount is about. Sermon on the Mount is two ways, but the audience, there are no pagans in the audience. There's two different audiences. There's those he's trying to disciple, and there's the religious leaders. And so the Sermon on the Mount is about two ways to live, heart righteousness versus merely external religion. Which is why Jesus comes, and if you want to flip over there, if you're in 23, you can just flip back a few pages to Matthew chapter 5. That's why it says in chapter 5, verse 20. He says, I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, again, the scribes, that's the teachers of the law, the Pharisees. That was the most zealous, most strict group within Judaism. Those are the people you looked at, and it was hard to find something externally. They were the holiest of the holy externally. And Jesus says here, your righteousness, church, must exceed theirs. Well, how could we ever do that? They add rule upon rule upon rule. Well, the issue was they weren't righteous from the heart. They looked good on the outside, but their hearts were far from the Lord, which is why we see Jesus do what he does in the rest of this sermon. Just look at Matthew 5.21. You've heard it was said to those of old, you shall not murder Whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Externally, do not murder. I think most of us can handle that. Most people can handle that. But he ups the ante and says, you can't even get angry. I'm going for the heart. I want total heart transformation. Or look over at verse 27, Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 27. You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, seventh commandment. But I say to you, Everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery. Jesus ups the ante. He goes for the heart. We look at chapter 6, verse 1. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people 
in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. When you give, don't make it about other people. Do it secretly, he says. It's one of the reasons we don't pass the plate here at Southside. We have offering boxes and encourage giving online. Or don't pray just to look holy. Look at verse 5 of chapter 6. When you pray, Jesus says, you must not be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, pray to your father who's in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. Or when you fast, as John Christ mentioned, look in chapter 6, verse 16. When you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. This one's really funny to me because I've got some friends, and some of them are Catholic, some of them are Protestant, who do practice uh, Lent. And so what they'll do is they'll go to their first, you know, Wednesday, Ash Wednesday service, and they'll get the cross, and they'll post selfies. When Jesus says, actually, wash your face, don't post selfies of the cross. Don't do your religion to be seen by others. This is the problem with hypocrites. Look at chapter 7, verse 5. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Flipping over a few pages, chapter 15. Verse 7, you hypocrites, Jesus says, well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Jesus wants true obedience from the heart. And so a major theme in the ministry and teaching of Jesus Christ is the bankruptcy of hypocrisy. So point number one, you're in good company. Number two, we got to consider what the Bible actually teaches about what it means to be a Christian. We've got to consider the biblical doctrine of conversion. What I mean by this is we've got to understand that just because someone says they're a Christian does not mean they've actually been born again. The Bible teaches that conversion is a work of God. And so there are many people, what we might call nominal Christians, in name only Christians, especially in Abilene, Texas. But they don't really know the Lord. They say they're Christians, but they don't know the Lord. And Jesus addresses them well, as well in the Sermon on the Mount. Look at Matthew chapter 7. Towards the end. He's laid out the two ways, true and false prophets, true and false fruit, and here's true and false disciples in Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, there'll be a lot that will say. There's a lot in Abilene that say to me, Lord, Lord. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So there are many, many, many what we would call false converts. I was one of them until I was 18 years old. You would ask me, I would have said, I'm a Christian. I wasn't converted till a freshman in college. Hadn't given my life to the Lord. Life wasn't characterized by faith and repentance, by turning from sin towards God. There was no life change. 2 Timothy 3 says they have a form of godliness, but they deny its power. So they're truly hypocrites, but they're not really hypocrites because they don't really know the Lord. A Christian is one who follows Jesus, always imperfectly, but strives to follow him. So if a person claims to be a Christian, but their life is the opposite of what Jesus says, there's reason to doubt whether or not that person is actually a Christian. So if this objection means a lot to you, let me encourage you not to dismiss the real thing based on a counterfeit. 
Crusades are a really good example here. The Crusades are often thrown out as an example. But listen, that war was not Christian. It was geopolitical. Western Europe was in a geopolitical war while being culturally Christian. The church and the state were mixed. So to be part of the state was to be part of the church. I remember hearing one author say that mixing church and state is like trying to mix ice cream and manure. Ice cream is the church, manure is the state. You mix ice cream and manure, manure is going to be pretty unaffected. The ice cream is going to be ruined. It's not the Lord's will that the church should ever be coincided with the state. That was the problem. So when they went to go fight a war, it was under the banner of the Roman Catholic Church. They were political. They were nationalistic battles. They were not religious battles, not in truth. Because biblically, again, this is the issue. Don't miss the counterfeit for the real thing. Biblical Christianity says that church doesn't fight physical battles. Ephesians 6, our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against people. 2 Corinthians 10, our weapons, the weapons of our warfare are not physical. They're not of the flesh. Jesus says in John 18, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my people would fight. Jesus calls his people to love their enemies. So many of the atrocities done in the name of Christianity are done not because of biblical Christianity. They're at odds with the teaching of the scriptures. So don't miss the real thing because counterfeits exist. Let me encourage you to assess Christianity based upon the word of God, not based upon people who distort it or fail to follow it. And for us who do claim to be believers, this is a good area that we need to stop and do what Paul commands us to do in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, and that is examine ourselves. Paul commands us, let us examine ourselves to see whether we are in the faith. Do we really know the Lord? According to Matthew 7, does the Lord know us? Have you genuinely trusted in Christ and are now living in light of that trust as James would tell us do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. So that's the second area. We've got to consider what the Bible actually teaches about conversion. The third explanation is that we're all works in progress. Even those who are genuinely born again Christians will never attain to perfection in this life. So part of the response is when the church is called filled with hypocrites, they say, you're right. The reason we become Christians is because we know we're hypocrites. The reason we come to Christ is because we know we don't have it all together. We need forgiveness. This is the whole point of the Christian faith. This is why the cross is the centerpiece of Christianity. It's because it's there that sinners find forgiveness. It is there that Jesus died in the place of sinners. So yes, we're hypocrites. That's why we're Christians. Maybe you've seen the bumper sticker. It says, Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven. And I don't love that message. Uh, it's true, but there's more to say. Because even after people become Christians, we will continue to battle sin. But that's the key word, battle. Christians aren't those that are okay with their sin. Christians are those who battle their sin. As I said the other day in Jonah, it's okay not to be okay. It's not okay to stay that way. We grow to be like Jesus. We grow in holiness, but it's progressive. It's over time. And isn't it sometimes frustratingly, painfully slow? But there's growth. I love the way the Apostle Paul puts it in Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, 10 says this. He says, I want to know Jesus. I want to, I want to know the power of his resurrection I want to share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained this or am already perfect. Teleos is the word there. I'm not there. I'm not perfect. But I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own brothers. I do not consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Then he says, let those of us who are, ESV says mature, it's the same word though, teleos. It's the same word that verse 10 said was perfect. Let those of us who are perfect think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Did you catch that? I'm not perfect, Paul says. 
I won't be until the resurrection, but I strain forward to perfection. Forget the past, move on, I press on. And all who are perfect will agree with me. So Christian perfection consists of knowing we will never attain perfection until the resurrection of the dead. That's what it means to be a mature Christian disciple is know that you will need the grace of Jesus till the day you die. So we're all works in progress. And then fourth and finally, the reality of hypocrisy in the church just confirms our message. The message of Christianity, as I mentioned about the gospel project, is not be good people. I think that's what most people that aren't Christians think Christianity is all about. Going to church is about becoming a good person. That is not the message of Christianity. The message of Christianity is that none of us are good, but God has not left us to ourselves. We have sinned against him in word and deed and thought, and God in grace enters history in the person of Jesus Christ, lives the life we should have lived, died the death we should have died, was raised from the dead, and ascended to the right hand of God, and we can have forgiveness of our sins through trust and repentance, trusting in him. That's the message of Christianity. God saves sinners. Not that we need to turn over a new leaf. We need new life. We don't need a makeover. We need a heart transplant. Jesus himself said he didn't come for the righteous. He came for sinners. God justifies the ungodly. Justify is a really important word in the Bible. It means to declare in the rights. Notice it says he justifies the ungodly. God doesn't justify the godly. He, un- he justifies the ungodly. He justifies hypocrites who put their trust in Jesus Christ. He came for those who know they didn't have it all together. And those who thought they had it all together, he often butted heads with, like we saw in Matthew chapter 23. He was often in trouble with the religious leaders. I think about Luke chapter 7. I don't have time to turn there, but Luke 7, 36 to 52, there's a story where Jesus goes in and he's invited by this religious leader named Simon, a Pharisee. He comes in and he's talking with Simon and this prostitute just barges on in. And is weeping over her sin. She had found forgiveness in Christ and she hits the floor and she's shedding tears of repentance and joy at the feet of Jesus and wiping it up with her own hair. And Simon is judging her. And Simon is judging Jesus as well. I love how Luke says it. Luke says, Simon thought to himself, if this guy really was a prophet, he would know that this is a sinner. And then Jesus answers him. Answers his thought. And he ends up rebuking Simon, and he tells Simon to learn from this woman. Simon, you, wanna, you had me over. Let me teach you about hospitality by looking to this woman, this prostitute. She knows better than you do, Simon. So again, if you have trouble with the religious, hypocritical, judgmental type, so does Jesus. Christianity is a religion for people who don't have it all together. Christianity is a religion for sinners. So you ask, is the church full of hypocrites? No. There's always room for one more. (laughs) If you're looking for a church that has no hypocrites, don't join it. As soon as you do, it will contain hypocrites. But join us. Because Jesus came to save hypocrites. When you say Christians are hypocrites, we say you're right. And there's room because Christ comes to save people like us. The Bible's really full of them. You know, we often, again, this is why I love the Gospel Project. If we were to use the, especially the figures of the Old Testament, just as moral examples, children be like them, there's actually very few examples we have that are legitimate. They're all hypocrites. They're all people just like us. Just consider some of these lug nuts. It begins with Adam. Adam blows it. He had all these yeses, one commandment, he blows it. Has a son. Maybe he'll get it right. Cain, what does he do? Kills his brother. Then God judges the world, but he saves one family, Noah. How does Noah end up after the flood, drunk and naked? How about Abraham? He lies not once but twice about his wife, and then his son Isaac follows his example. The sons of Jacob get jealous about their little brother and sell him off into slavery. Moses had a temper, kills a guy, later disobeyed the direct commandment of the Lord. David, rapist and a murderer. Had a son named Solomon. Deuteronomy 17 had laid out, I don't know, eight or ten things that a king should be. Solomon literally broke every one of them. What about the kings? We want to name our our firstborn son after a king. You've got to look long and hard to find one that's even worth naming a son after. There's one, Josiah. That's what we went with. We just finished a four-week series on Jonah. 
It was called How Not to Be a Prophet. You get the picture. We are a motley crew. We are great sinners. Christ is a greater Savior. Though our sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. So look to him. Don't look to us. I love how one author puts it. He says, Christianity does not stand or fall on the way Christians have acted throughout history or are acting today. Christianity stands or falls on the person of Jesus. And Jesus was not a hypocrite. He lived consistently with what he taught. And at the end of his life, he challenged those who had lived with him night and day for over three years to point out any hypocrisy in him. His disciples were silent because there was none. Since Christianity depends on Jesus, it's incorrect to try to invalidate the Christian faith by pointing to horrible things done in the name of Christianity, end quote. So look to Christ, not people. We will fail you every single time. We're all works in progress, but even you, right? We all have gaps, right? All of us have gaps. There's this, this person that we aspire to be, and we often fall short, all of us. Here's a good way to think about it. Think about you. And then think about the Facebook you. Usually there's a gap, right? Sometimes I don't recognize people after I've seen their Facebook profile. There is a gap. There's who we want to be. There's who we aspire to be. There's who we want others to think we are. And then there's us. And more often than not, there's a gap. One time Jesus was brought in. Often the, the religious leaders would try to trap him. And they had found, the religious leaders had found somehow, they had found a woman caught in the act of adultery. According to the law, such a woman is to be stoned. And so they see an opportunity here and they take this woman and they get Jesus and say, how are you going to handle this? And they want to test him. How will this rabbi treat this woman who's supposed to be stoned for what she has done? Maybe remember Jesus leans over and draws something in the sand. No one knows what he drew. But then he said, let him who has no sin cast the first stone at this woman. John tells us that one by one, the leaders just kind of started backing away until it was just him and her. And Jesus asked her, has no one condemned you? And she says, no one. And he says, neither do I. Go leave your life of sin. Let him who has no sin cast the first stone. And that'll be none of us. As St. Augustine said, the church is a hospital for sinners, not a museum for saints. The fact that we can blow it at times doesn't mean Christ isn't who he said he is. Sometimes scientists produce weapons of mass destruction. Does that mean we should dismiss all science? No. The character of those discovering truth does not negate the truth. Same with all religions. And the atheists will say, well, it's religion that causes all this bloodshed. It's actually atheism that has shed more blood in the last hundred years than any other ideology. Just consider, Hitler killed his six million. The Khmer Rouge and Cambodia killed two million of their own. Stalin killed 20 million. Mao exterminated 60 million of his own people. The issue is not primarily about the character of the adherence of the truth. It's about the truth itself. What is the truth? the objective truth. And that's what we're going to spend most of the fall here, uncovering the truth of Christianity. Hope you'll come. So you have a problem with hypocrisy? Jesus agrees with your assessment. We got to keep in mind that the Bible teaches that there are both true and false converts. Those of us who are truly born again, we are a work in progress and we will never attain perfection in this life. And finally, the reality of hypocrisy confirms our message, Jesus came to save sinners.